How's everybody today? Whew, I tell you what, we have been trying to chase down ghosts in our sound system for two weeks now. For some reason, the monitors on the stage have just decided to be silent. And uh, so I don't know if they've joined a monastery or, or what, but they're, they're not giving us sound properly. So we're kind of making this up as we go along. <laughs> everything appears to be on and everything appears to be right, but they're not giving us a lot of sound up here. So we're going to try to figure that one out and see what's going on. Maybe this week get somebody up here to look at that. But for now, we're going to worship the Lord and uh, have a good time in the Lord's name. Hey, isn't it beautiful outside? Now, I realize it's hotter than a nine-eyed stove. I get that, right? That's, you know, and, uh, and it's, it's hard to decide if it's really hot or if it's just really humid. I think maybe it's really hot and it's really humid. I think it's a little bit of both. So, um, but anyway, it's still a beautiful day and God has blessed us with that and we get to be here in the Lord's house and what a blessing that is. We're going to start things off this morning with Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. It says, So embrace as the elect of God, holy and beloved, a spirit of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long suffering. Bear with one another and forgive one another. If anyone has a quarrel against anyone, even as Christ forgave you, so you must do. And above all these things, embrace love, which is the bond of perfection. Let the peace of God, to which also you are called in one body, rule in your hearts. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the day. Thank you that we get to worship you today. Thank you that we have the freedom to do so. And Lord, I thank you for this beautiful day the, uh, without rain, to be able to uh, just come together into your house, to lift your name in praise. And Lord, I praise you for the great, wonderful things you're doing in each and every life that's here uh, some are going through struggles, some are coming out of struggles, some are going into struggles, some are just having wonderful days. But through it all, no matter what is uh, ahead of us or behind us, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are the Lord of glory, and we want to worship you for all that you have done for us and for all that you're going to do in the future. Lord, I pray you bless our, our uh, worship time now and, and our sermon, Lord, and everything we do today. May it bring you honor and glory and praise. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. All right, let's stand together. We're going to kick things off with a good old faithful song, Here I Am to Worship. This one's been around for a few years now. I mean, it's ancient. It's, it was written in 2001. That's a long time ago, right? When you think of some of the hymns that were written in the 1800s and stuff, this one's relatively new, but it is a great, great message. Pastor needs his capo. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Light of the world. Light of the world. You step down into darkness. Open my eyes. Let me Here I am to worship. Here I am to worship. Here 
next song, you usually have Amanda lead out on, and uh, this time I want you to sing it. You're going to be the soloist in it, and uh, I love the song. The, the, the message in this is so incredible. The first time I heard this on the radio, I thought, oh, now there's a song. Because in the darkness, we were waiting without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running, and there was mercy in your eyes. To fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin came the word, from a throne of endless glory, to a cradle in the dirt. What a lyric, what a wonderful, wonderful message, and it just goes on from there. I love the song, King of Kings, let's sing together.
wonderful God we have. And all he asks, and all that he did, coming from the throne of glory to a cradle in the dirt, and going through all this great narrative that we have of the scripture, that you realize this, this started, this didn't just start in the moment that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. This started in the heart of God before he ever said, let there be light. Because he knew the moment he said, let there be light, what it would cost. He knew every bit what it would cost him to have us in his life. And for some reason, in the great, wonderful grace, mercy, and love of God, he decided that it was worth it. I'll never know what kind of grace and love that is. Because I think we'll spend all eternity learning more and more of who God is, and I don't know that we'll ever grasp the infinite love and mercy and grace of God. And all he asks in return for that is that we bring this wicked, sinful, filthy heart to him and hand it over and let him clean it up. That's all he asks. We owe nothing because Jesus paid it all. And so today we want to sing this. This is my desire to honor you. And Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. I give you my heart. Let's sing it together. This is my desire to honor you. Lord, with all my heart, I 
few years back, a young feller by the name of Steve Green sang a song and called Embrace the Cross. And he placed on the beginning of that song one of the most beautiful choruses I think ever written. And it's been around since, was that 1992? A song written by John G. Eliot, and it says, I am crucified with Christ, straight from the scripture, therefore I no longer live. Jesus Christ now lives in me. I am crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. Jesus Christ now lives in me. I I am crucified. I am crucified with Christ. Therefore, I no longer live. Jesus Christ now lives in me. I am crucified with Christ. Therefore, I no longer live. Jesus Christ now lives in me. Good morning. It is good to be back. You got me? All right. It is good to be back in, uh, did Louisiana come to visit while I was gone and decide to stay a week? Because it is, this is not what I left. I, I did not leave 100% humidity, so I don't know who's in charge of that. I don't know who's responsible. Jim, Moore, is it your job to... You know, I don't know, but uh, it is good to be home. It is good to be back. We uh, really appreciate all your prayers as we uh, got Naomi moved in, and uh, we're still in that process. But thank you for your prayers. Uh, I, as you can see behind me, uh, I think we're getting ready to have VBS. Uh, I don't know if you figured that out yet. And uh, we have another work night this Wednesday. So even if you're not working in VBS, we can put you to work this Wednesday to help us out. That's from 6 to 8 uh, this, this week. And uh, we would encourage you to come and, and uh, be a part of, of this work. And even if you're not going to be at the work night, and even if you're not helping in VBS, we need you to start praying every day. Make it a part of your daily prayer time with the Lord, whether it's at lunch or at dinner, at supper time, before you go to bed, when you get up, whenever it is. And uh, lift this whole outreach, all of the discipleship that's going to happen, the preaching and the teaching of the gospel, the kids and the families, the directors, uh, pray fervently for uh, this. Because we can plan and put up beautiful things like this, but if the power of God's Holy Spirit, if the gospel isn't being taught clearly, if, if hearts aren't being prepared by the Lord himself, uh, this is his work, okay? So spiritual growth and spiritual things happening, that is a work of the Lord. So we, we need to beg him uh, to uh, show up and do the work that he's promised to do. Also, uh, a four-year project continues to move forward. We are painting now. Uh, and when I say we, I mean Russ <laughs> is painting, and we're all watching. Right, Mark? Yeah, Mark and Russ were painting last week, and there's going to be some more painting this week. But we're moving forward and uh, really excited about that. So please keep praying for the four-year project as we try to, uh, to get back over there. And remember, this is the last week we will socially distance before and during any of our services or classes. So next week, this week, deacons, we're still going to dismiss as usual we're still going to socially distance inside, but next week, unless something strange happens, we'll be back to as normal as possible with people like us. I don't know how normal, you can't be normal if I'm the pastor, but you know, as normal as, normal as possible with me being the pastor, we will, we'll get back to that next week. And let me just give you some, some guidelines to help you with this. Okay, first of all, if, if you're uncomfortable with, with us moving in this direction, you need to call me and see me. We can accommodate that. We can make you comfortable. We'll, we'll, we'll get you seated in a such a way and, and placed in such a way so that you can still be socially distanced. Um, secondly, not everybody's going to want a hug next week. Okay? In fact, not everybody wants a hug. Okay? 
So, you know, if you're going up to hug and somebody held, holds out a hand, don't take offense, take their hand, okay? So, you know, just because we're not socially distanced, that doesn't mean, you know, you run and jump up and, and uh, you know, Brother Billy's arms, you know, and, and uh, give him a big old hug. He may not really be into that, right, Brother Billy? I don't know. He might be. But uh, so if somebody kind of gives that, hey, I'm not really ready to shake hands and I'll wave, just respect that space, all right? Because we've been doing this for what? 15, 16 months, and, uh, uh, you know, so it's eventually going to get back to normal, folks. Um, we're gonna, this is going to be in the rearview mirror, and we'll have to remember that this year happened. But that's not going to be next week, okay? Next week, we'll all go, I hope I don't give them COVID. I hope I don't give them No, you won't. It's good. Everybody's safe, all right? So next week, no social distancing, and I don't know about you. I'm excited about that, all right? Um, and so the plan uh, right now, and of course, our plans are subject to change, right? But the plan is to eventually be back in the, in the sanctuary, hopefully sometime this summer, depending upon all the timing of the finishing up of the four-year project. Once the four-year project is at least partially completed where we can have services, we'll head back over there for worship in the sanctuary, which is, which is awesome. And I'm looking forward to that day. Uh, the only thing is you don't get to take your padded chair with you. Those will go back to the Sunday school classrooms. All right, why don't you uh, bow with me. Let's pray and ask God to, to bless uh, the preaching of his word this morning as we look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48. Let's pray. Father, we simply ask you this morning to, uh, as we open your book and turn on our electronic device to read along and to study, that you would open our hearts, you would soften our hearts and our conscience, you would help us to hear your word anew, even though these are familiar words. And that through your spirit and the preaching of your word, you would reveal in us uh, maybe some things in our heart that we don't even see ourselves. Father, as we go through this Sermon on the Mount, as we've been through this, I pray that the sermon would go through us. And that we would become Christians. Not just in our confession, but in our character and nature. Make us your people, not just on the outside, but completely from the inside out. In Jesus' name. And everyone said? Let's read Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48. This is the text I preached two weeks ago. I could only get through a couple of verses. And uh, I, I was going to preach the whole thing. And then I realized that would take it till about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, so I made that uh, change. So look at verse 43. He says, You have heard that it was said... So we have second-hand information passed down generationally. You shall love your neighbor, that's in the Old Testament, but hate your enemy, that's not in the Old Testament. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Now notice Jesus is assuming that relationship already exists. We are the people of the Beatitudes who have come into the kingdom of God humbly. We are thirsting and longing for righteousness. We are, we are those kinds of people because of the gospel and because of Jesus. And because God is our Father, we need to love our enemies because that's what God does. Verse 45, he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? And the assumed answer is, None. Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Let me translate that. Do not even the worst kinds of sinners love those who love them? And what's the answer? Yeah, that is true. And if you greet your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect. Now, what's the point of comparison here? Just as your Father in heaven is perfect. So we need a short review of this passage to make sure we know where we are. Remember the problem that I preached about two weeks, uh, two weeks ago is that in first century Judaism, they had a narrow definition of neighbor. Neighbor was someone who looked like them, sounded like them. It was of their clan and of their country and of their religion. That's who their neighbor was. They had a very narrow definition of the word neighbor, but they had a broad definition of the word enemy. And that was the problem. So Jesus 
flips the script and gives a solution and tells them to love your enemies. And by doing that, he actually broadens the definition of neighbor to include enemies. So when you're loving your neighbor, that includes the people who hate you. That includes the people who use you, persecute you, slander you, libel you. Whoo! We could just go home and ponder that for a minute, couldn't we? In fact, Jesus, do we, we have the, uh-oh, did we lose our screen? There we go. In fact, Jesus tells us this is what we're supposed to be doing. And notice these are all I-N-G. That means while they are cursing you, not after you've had time to think about it. I'm going to go home and I just don't know if it's God's will for me to bless this person. I just, you know, I, I, this drives me up the wall. People come to the church office and go, hey, I need some help here. Now, I know what the Bible says, preacher, but I, I really want to pray about it. If you know what the Bible says, get busy doing it. What do you need? You don't need to pray about it. If you know what the Bible says and what the Bible is teaching. So Jesus, he, he just says it clearly. If they're cursing you, what do you do? You bless them. And you keep on blessing them. If they're hating you, you know what you do? You serve them and do them good. If they are verbally abusing and persecuting you, you're supposed to be praying. I and G. If they're hating you, you're loving them. And I love this one. If they're ignoring you, you know, those snobs. You ever know those people are just snobs? They're just cliquish. They don't talk to them, and I don't talk to them, and that, that even happens in church, right? You know what Jesus says? Greet them. And not out of an ill will, not out of, hey, you didn't talk to me, but he's saying in, in, a, in a loving, gracious manner, greet those people. Identify them. Because greeting in that first century was a sign of respect and honor. It wasn't just, hey, Brother Dick, how are you doing? It was peace and shalom from the Lord to another person. And you're asking God to bless that person in that greeting. Well, they're, they're ignoring me. Well, guess what? Jesus says, greet them. Bless them. Okay, so let's just all agree. They're Facebook land too. Let's just all agree when we look at this text that this is unnatural. This does not come second nature to us. Secondly, this is, this is narrow. So what Jesus is teaching here, the ethic that Jesus is teaching you and me, is a narrow ethic. He broadens the definition of neighbor, and he calls us and commands us to love our enemies. And let's just, let's just make sure we understand, this is hard. This is one of the hard teachings of Jesus. Okay, we're down here in the south. Everybody loves Jesus. Okay, it's one of the problems. Everybody loves Jesus. Nobody follows him. <laughs> no one bothers to obey him. But we all love Jesus. Well, I just, I got news for you. We don't all love Jesus down here. And this is a command from Jesus for his followers. So if I say that Jesus is my Savior, if I say and confess him as my Lord, if I say that I want to follow Jesus, I have to bring myself under his yoke of discipleship, and it begins with love. And that is narrow, that is hard, but it is inescapable. And when you look at this... <laughs> you realize immediately that you need help with this, don't you? That this is an impossible standard to love your enemies, and that's exactly what Jesus wants you to sense, that you need a new heart, that you need Jesus, that you need his help, you need the gospel's help, you need to have the gospel preached to you continually so that you can learn how to love, so that we can learn how to love not only those who love us, not only those who are like us, but those who are unlike us and those who don't like us and those who hurt us. Now today what I want to tell you or what I want to share with you from this passage is why this is so necessary. Why does Jesus command this of his followers? The first reason is because of your Savior. As I just stated in verse 44, look at those first, that first phrase in verse 44. But I say to you. 
So let, let's, let's make this personal. Mike, you okay with a little illustration here? Jesus is saying to Mike. Jesus is saying to Larry and Cindy. Jesus is saying to Miss Judy. So this is Jesus. Okay, Jesus, save me. Take me to heaven. I want, I want to follow you. And Jesus says, okay. I'm going to tell you something. Are you ready? Love your enemies. Come on. Love your enemies. Love your enemies. Follow me. It's inescapable. If we are going to claim to be Jesus' people, we have to do Jesus' commands. And either we stop claiming it, or we start doing it. The other reason you need to, to do this because of your Savior is not just because it's his command, it's also his example. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2. And I want you to turn there. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2. Because one of the great things about Jesus is Jesus never commands us to do something he didn't do, right? Do you realize that Jesus literally fulfilled every single one of these commands throughout his life? And then all, all, and certainly through his death? Look at 1 Peter chapter 2. For to this you were called. You ever hear people say, I just wish I knew what God was calling me to. You ever have that? I just, I just want to know God's will for my life. And really what they're asking is, should I buy that car? I wish God would just tell me whether or not to buy that car. Okay, let's just back up the train. The Bible's very clear about what God has called us to. You know what God has called us to in 1 Peter 2? Suffer. This is why Peter tells them over and over again, stop acting like this is some type of surprise, like Jesus didn't tell us this was coming. It should not surprise us when rough and difficult waters come. Jesus said they would. Peter says, for to this you were called, because Christ also suffered. Now why did Jesus suffer? For us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, that is when they blasphemed him, when they spoke evil of him, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he committed him, him to himself to him who judges righteously, who himself, that is Jesus himself, bore our sins in his own body on the tree. So Jesus fulfilled all of these demands that he made of us as his disciples by living and dying in our place because of us, instead of us, and for us. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree. Now why did he do that? Look at verse 24. Why did Jesus do that? Now you hear people say, well, Jesus died so I could go to heaven. Jesus died so I don't have to go to hell. And you take this wonderful, grand, glorious gospel and you make it just about one thing. And it's not one thing. And by the way, the one thing is not you getting to heaven. The one thing is the glory of God. That's why Jesus did all of this. And one of the sub-points of that is we get to go to heaven and we don't have to go to hell. But look at verse 24. Jesus suffered and bore our sins on the tree. Look at what he says. This, is, this will set you free. That we, having died to sins, might live for what? Now remember in the Beatitudes, Jesus said, if you hunger and thirst for righteousness, what's he going to do? He's going to fill you up. What's the righteousness that Jesus wants us to fulfill? One of the things, and one of the main things, in fact, it's the second main thing, is to love our neighbor as ourselves. Jesus died on the cross so you could follow your Savior and love your enemies. So that you could experience what it is like to be Jesus. So you could experience just a little bit what it's like to be betrayed, what it's like to be hurt, what it's like to be falsely accused, what it is like to then respond in grace and mercy and forgiveness. That's why we must love our enemies, because of our Savior. We also need to love our enemies because of our Father. Look at verse 45, back in our text. He says, that, he says so you're going to do this, love your enemies, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. 
For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Well, you need to, first of all, love your enemies because of who your father is. Now, when you look at verse 45, please don't misinterpret this to mean you need to love your enemies so you will be right before God, you'll be saved, and everything will be okay. Jesus is not saying that loving your enemies is a means of salvation. He's not talking about that. He's already said that God is our father already, right? So when he's talking about us becoming or being the sons or daughter and daughters of our Father in heaven, he's talking about in our character, in our nature, and how we relate to other people. That when we love our enemies, we are being like our Father in heaven. We are taking on his character and his likeness and how we look at others, how we treat others, how we speak about others, how we think about others. Now, as proof of that, he not only tells us who our Father is, who's God, God the Father, but he also tells us what God the Father does. Now, how does loving our enemies relate to God the Father? Look look back at the verse. He says, for he, that is God the Father, now the most important word, or one of the most important words in this statement is right here. For he makes, what's the next word? His son. Now, here's the problem you and I have. Jesus, or God the Father, sends his son, rise, son to rise on the evil and the good. It's not our son, it's his. We borrow the warmth from God the Father every day, even when it's hot like it is today. Those are, that's borrowed energy, it's not ours. The sun, the earth, the moon, and the stars, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, everything he's created belongs to him I belong to him in creation and salvation I belong to him I am not my own through creation and redemption I am bought at a price and that price is the blood of Jesus God the Father sends his Son, uh, sends his reign on the just and the unjust. When we love our enemies, we are doing exactly what God the Father is doing right now. Did you know this morning, as we sit here in this worship service, there are millions upon millions, even billions, that are not thanking God for all the gifts that he's given them. As I was thinking about the sermon this morning and I was thinking about my own life, I was, I was shaving and, and brushing my teeth and I looked down and I saw my hands. Because they kind of hurt a little bit. Because I'm getting older and I've got a little bit of arthritis. And I realized something about myself. Not one time in my entire existence have I ever thanked God that I have ten fingers that work. Not one time. I just took those things for granted. Take those things for granted because they're mine. It's my hand. No, it's not my hand to do with as I please. This belongs to the Lord. I mean, how many of us got ready for worship this morning and you're getting ready to sing? Well, some of y'all were getting ready and some of y'all just kind of sat there and looked at me, but some of y'all were singing and you filled up your lungs. Did you thank God for that? That he created a system to give you air and breath and then exhale his praise? Chances are we didn't. And here while we sit without anybody having to see it, our pulse and our heart rate just keeps bumping along because God allows it. Now listen to me. God the Father does that for billions of people who never ever acknowledge his gifts or who's given them. That's why we have to love our enemies. Because that's what God is doing right now to all of creation. Every single person, every single human is being blessed by our Father right now. Now, I want you to think about this for a second. This is going to get a little uncomfortable. You okay, Gary? Going to get a little uncomfortable. Sharon? All right, right, here we go. If loving my enemy makes me like God the Father, when I persist in unforgiveness, bitterness, bitterness, angst, vengeance, and snobbery, who am I emulating? Satan. 
see that? When we love our enemies, it makes us like God. When we hold on to bitterness and unforgiveness, it makes you like the devil himself. So we gotta, we got to love our enemies because of God the Father. We also need to love our enemies because of our testimony. Look at verse 46 and 47. Jesus asked very simply, now we, we know that human beings are capable of loving those who love them. We see parental love that is a gift of common grace. Human beings created in the image and likeness of God, even though they are fallen and sinful, are able to love those who love them. It's a natural, normal thing to respond with love to those who love you. People without Jesus are able to love their friends, their family, and those like them. And if we only love those who love us, we fail, we fail to give testimony to who we really belong to. Jesus gives these two examples. And, he, and in both of these examples, he says, don't the tax collectors. In other translations, he'll say tax collectors and Gentiles. What he's saying is even lost people who aren't a part of the kingdom, who don't know me, they love like this. They love those who love them. What sets us apart, what gives us a testimony that we actually belong, that something supernatural has happened in our life, is when we go beyond doing what everyone else does and we do what the Lord himself does, which is to love our enemies. Now look back at uh, chapter 5. Just flip one page over in your Bible. What does Jesus call us in verse 13 of chapter 5? Salt. Salt is supposed to influence. Salt comes into contact. It's supposed to influence and preserve. But Jesus says if the salt loses its efficacy or its power, it becomes polluted and it's useless and is just thrown out into the streets. A Christian that only loves those who love them, them, it's like salt without any power. Do you want to know one of the reasons why the world doesn't listen to the gospel we preach? Because they're looking at the gospel we're living. And they don't see anything supernatural about our lives because we're just doing what everybody else does. Our lives look exactly the same. They listen to how we talk at work, how we live at work, how we treat others at work, how gossipy and divisive and bitter and angsty and everything else that we just carry around with us. And they don't see anything supernatural at all about this faith that we claim to have. Verse 16, what are we called in chapter 5? We're salt, we're also light. So part of the light we're supposed to shine is loving our enemies. And when we love our enemies and that light is shining, they will see our good works and glorify our Father who is where? In heaven. That's about our testimony, church. Now, please listen to me. You may, say, you may say that's not that big of a deal. It is a big deal. It's a gospel issue. Whether or not you are willing to try to love your enemies determines whether or not you really do believe the gospel is true. Now, think about this for a second. God brings you into a situation where you've been wronged and you have to try to persevere in love towards an enemy. You've got to ask yourself, well, okay, why should I do that, Lord? And the Lord says, well, that's what I did for you. You were my enemy. You hated me and hated others. You were blind and in darkness. You walked away from me. You didn't pay attention to me. You didn't love me. You didn't greet me. You didn't fellowship with me. And then, but I kept on loving you. And I kept on loving you. And eventually your eyes were opened, your heart was broken, and you started believing in me. You see, this is a gospel issue. So, I, no, 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 you don't understand. See, I, I believe that the gospel's for me. I mean, the go, I, mean I, I want the gospel. I want the good news. I just don't think it applies to him. No, no, God can save people like me, but he can't save people like them. Because we disagree about fill in the blank. They did this to me, fill in the blank. Therefore, they're beyond redemption. <laughs> Look, if anyone's beyond redemption, everyone is beyond redemption. This is a gospel issue, folks. I told you this was narrow. I've been thinking about this for about three weeks, well, actually longer. How, how in the world am I going to preach this? 
Only thing I know to do is tell you what it says, <laughs> and then we can wrestle with it. We need to love our enemies because of our testimony. We also need to love our enemies because of our sanctification. Look at verse 48. Now, this is an uncomfortable verse, but we need to put it in context. Therefore, and I really believe what Jesus is doing is actually bringing to a close the whole section that began in verse 21 with this therefore statement, okay? So that remember, this is the series called The Heart of the Matter and how we've talked about uh, murder and anger and lust and adultery. And we've, we've talked about telling the truth and Jesus is getting to the heart of all those issues, right? And here we are kind of close, kind of wrapping this up. And Jesus says, therefore, you shall be perfect. And look at the standard for perfection. He says, just as your neighbor. Just make sure you're better than your neighbor. No, oh, oh wait a minute. What's, what, let me take off my glasses. Just as your Father in heaven is perfect. All right, let's go home. <laughs> let's just not even talk about this. This is a tough one, isn't it? This is a tough verse. But here's the thing. Remember, verses all have context, right? Jesus is not talking about how to be saved in this verse. This is a sermon preached to his disciples. He's talking about sanctification here. That began at your conversion. And Jesus is talking about, number one, the expected God's expectation of sanctification in those who follow him. And secondly, he's thinking about the desired or the ultimate end of sanctification at the end of the road when we meet Christ. Jesus is not uh, giving, because a lot of people will take verse 48 and they'll say, okay, Jesus is giving us a whole new set of rules that are really hard to follow. That that's what the Sermon on the Mount is. The Sermon on the Mount is, you thought Moses was tough, well, get a load of this. (laughs) That's not what Jesus is doing here. He's not giving us a new list of rules because Jesus is concerned with our heart. Now, how do I know that? We don't even have to leave the book of Matthew to know that. Listen to what Jesus says. Jesus came to save us from legalism and tradition. He said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you more rules, more rules. No, I'll give you rest. You want the rest of salvation? Lay down your righteousness. Lay down your legalism. Lay down your self-righteousness. Lay down your religion and come to Jesus for rest. You can't bear that yoke. Only one could bear the yoke of the Old Testament. And his name was Jesus. He goes on to say, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. There's rest in salvation. There's rest in discipleship. And he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Listen to what he says over in Matthew 15. Jesus knows that we have wicked, evil hearts. And that's the problem. Now, just listen to these words. This is after Jesus was teaching uh, about the Pharisees and their problems and their out- outward uh, Religion, he said, verse 16, Are you still without understanding? Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile man. Listen to that verse. The things that defile us are the things that proceed out of the mouth because they come from the heart. For out of the heart, our hearts proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. Jesus came to save us from an impossible standard. He knows the human heart, and he knows we need a new one. But here's what you've got to get. Most Baptists get that part, but they don't get this. Is that now that you have a new heart... Jesus can help you obey his word. Listen, you know what God's up to right now in your life? He's trying to make you perfect like your Father in heaven. He's trying to work on your sin. He's trying to work on your attitudes. He's trying to work on your mind. And he's trying to bring you to a place of moral perfection. He's trying to make you uncomfortable. He's letting you suffer and go through hard times because he's wanting you to see what he's calling you to. Therefore, you shall be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. That's what God is up to right now in this church. He's weeding us out. He's working on our hearts. And that's not a bad thing, folks. 
That's a loving thing. And eventually that sanctification that he expects in this life is going to give way to complete and full sanctification when we stand in the presence of Jesus. Where God makes us holy, holy, holy. All the way down to our DNA. That's what Jesus is referencing here. Sanctification is a present expectation of Jesus, and it's also a future reality. Listen to me, church. God is not interested in our fake, outside, hypocritical religion. He's not interested in our fake, outside religion putting on a show, making ourselves look good. He is not interested in that. He wants your heart. And he puts this this level of sanctification, this calling of sanctification, this call to love our enemies on us because he wants to lead us further down a road of sanctification and holiness. You're going to come to that crossroads when you have to love your enemy, and you're going to say, God, I know you've saved me, but I can't do this. He said, good, lesson one has been learned. Now let's move forward. It's got to be supernatural. If I'm going to love my enemies, Jesus, you're going to have to help me. You're going to have to live in me and live through me. All right, lesson number two has been learned. You can't do it. Jesus can do it through you. But Lord, I don't want to. Oh, now we're really talking. Let's get down to the will. It's about what you really, the the real issue here is what we want. (laughs) What we want is our pound of flesh. What we want is for everyone to know that we were right and they were wrong. What we want is to be vindicated. Aren't you glad that when Jesus found you in your sin, he didn't say, I want to be vindicated for everything he's done to me. I want judgment on them. Jesus did not do that to you. And you do not have the right or the authority to do that to anyone else. We will step back and let the Lord bring out the vengeance. And that's why some of us in this room right now are stuck. I was reading in Deuteronomy this morning where the Israelites were wandering around in the wilderness getting ready to wander around in the wilderness and they'd been kind of there at the mountain for a while and they had now been banished to to walk around in the wilderness for a while and and, uh, God through through Moses said you've been standing here at this mountain for long enough it's time to get moving listen to me I don't know what's happened to you it's a lot worse than I can imagine I'm sure I'm not sure what they did or what they didn't do. I'm not sure what injustice you're having to bear right now. I don't know any of that, but the Lord does. And here's what I do know, that if you do not persist in love towards your enemies, you are stuck where you are until you do. You cannot go forward with that kind of attitude. We cannot pray and hope to have answers to our prayers holding on to that. Listen, you need to love your enemies because of your own soul's sanctification. On the other side of trust and obedience is empowering. How many of y'all remember the illustration from the Corey Ten Ten Boom book from two weeks ago? She didn't want to. She knew she had to. She reaches out her hand and God meets her right there and pours out grace on her to love her enemy who brutally enslaved her in a Jewish Holocaust camp. Right? I'm telling you, on the other side of that obedience, Jesus is waiting. And he'll help you. Okay. Brother Scott, this is hard. Yes, it is. This is narrow. Yes, it is. This is impossible. Yes, it is. It has to be supernatural. We need Jesus to do this. We need Jesus to save us, empower us, and motivate us. But this command is inescapable. His word must shape our hearts and lives if we confess him as Savior and Lord. So two applications. Number one, maybe hearing this call of discipleship has awakened you to a need for a new heart. No one loves their enemies perfectly. It's going to be a series of trials and failures. Have you ever forgiven someone and then had to re-forgive them? How many of y'all have ever experienced that, experienced that where you, somebody hurts you and you forgive them and you put it back and you put it away and you walk on and then 
your flesh, and that person reminds you again of what happened, and then you get, how many of y'all ever had to do that? Yeah, you're not God. God can forgive and go, poof, and it never comes back. <laughs> I'm more like a, you know, I don't know how to throw a boomerang, but when I forgive somebody, it's kind of like a boomerang, and I'm just walking along, my and bam, right in the back of the head, and I have to deal with it again. You know what I have to do? Forgive them again. But maybe you're sitting here this morning, you go, I don't have any desire whatsoever to forgive and love my enemies. Well, friend, let me make sure you hear me. And may your conscience hear the Holy Spirit as I'm speaking to you. If you do not have a desire to even follow, even try to obey Jesus, you may not be his. Well, I'm not interested in this. Well, Jesus is. This is the righteousness he's calling us to. Well, I just want to go to heaven. No, 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 you don't understand. Heaven is a place of righteousness, holiness. Well, I'm not interested in that. I just don't want to have to go to hell. Well, friend, I, I, don't, I, think, somebody misunder- I think you misunderstood the gospel. Jesus died for our sins, right? So let, let, this, let this overwhelming command bring you to the foot of the cross where God loves his enemies. And saves his enemies. And where he'll save you. Secondly, maybe you need a new motive. Do you claim to be a Christ follower? Do you love him? Do you long for his righteousness? Do you want to please him and know him more fully? These are the questions we should be asking ourselves. Then answer his call. And love your enemy. Why don't you stand with me as we pray. And have a time of invitation. Father, for those who know you, I pray that this would be a time of repentance, a time where you will bring things to mind that need to be sorted out and dealt with before this service closes and before we leave. Father, for those who don't know you, I pray that they would see just how much you love them and how that you walk towards them in love and forgiveness and grace and mercy and that right now as we stand in this place together, That, Father, you are willing, because of Jesus, to forgive their sins and welcome them into your kingdom. Thank you for loving your enemies. Thank you for loving us. Save, O Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing. This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. All I have within me, I give you praise. All give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, Lord, have your way in me. This is my desire to all If you all I have within me, I give you praise. All that I adore is in you, Lord. I give you my heart. Give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, Lord.
Lord, have your way in me. Y'all can sit down if you'd like to. We just have an announcement real quick. Uh, this summer, we are not doing a big mission trip or going somewhere, but the youth group is going to do one here in Hot Springs, and we are inviting another church or two to come with us, and so that is going to be June 27th to 30th. I think that might have been announced on the uh, Wednesday update if you saw that, but if you didn't, what we're going to do is some service projects uh, around here, around the church and in the community, and try to share the gospel with some people, uh, and some of these things that we've been talking about in here. Uh, take outside of these walls and so it'll be a good chance for the youth to get together we're going to stay here at church or in houses and so uh, just be praying about that youth if you're going to go if you're interested I need to know by tomorrow so we can get you a t-shirt ordered so let me know Uh, just come talk to me like right after this or call me or whatever Uh, just let me know about that for the rest of you uh, we have a couple of opportunities if you'd like to help so first of all if you want to come and help from June 27th to 30th, that's a Wednesday night through a, or Sunday night through a Wednesday, then let me know and we will find something that you can do. Uh, Secondly, we have food. So we're going to have two meals that we're asking the church to provide and there are signups for those on that black table right there if you'd be willing to help. And then we'll need a few people within 10 to 15 minutes of the church that are willing to put a few teenagers in their house uh, for those three nights. And if they can get them here in the morning, and then back at night. And if it's too late, then we can bring them over there so you don't have to come out too late. And then finally, we need you to pray. Uh, We are praying for gospel opportunities and for uh, growth in the students, uh, but also that this community will be impacted because the youth are the church. They are people that God uses. They are people that God wants to use and to grow for his kingdom. So be praying for us.